Ready to roll? Well, okay. All yours. Uh, all mine. Okay. For those of you who don't know, I'm of a Polish background, and I grew up in a family where uh, I had an uncle who served in the Polish army, uh, who I'm named after, Stanley, and he unfortunately was taken into Russia along with my father's parents uh, when the German-Russian invasion of Poland in 1939 that started the war. And my mother and my sister and my other grandparents were also taken into, into Russia. And my aunt married a man who had, was in the Polish army in 1939, my uncle Adam, and he ended up in a Russian camp and later on was made a member of what's called the Polish Second Corps, or the Anders Army. And he was in uh, Palestine and North Africa and in Italy, and he was a veteran of the Battle of Monte Cassino. So as a young boy, I heard a lot of stories, okay? And my Uncle Adam, Adwiek Adam, for those of you who understand Polish, uh, would tell me a lot of things about army life and, and his experiences in Poland, in Russia, uh, Soviet Union, I'm sorry, and Italy and everything else. And he was one of the people that helped me understand the love he had for America. He used to always say, he goes, Canada, very close, number two. America, number one. <laughs> And that was, that was his attitude. And he said, all other countries, pfft. Uh, I, I said, what about going back to Poland? <clears throat> because his attitude was, once the communists took over, they had ruined the place. And uh, he had no intention of, of returning to uh, what the Bolsheviks had done. He had enough experience in Stalin's camps. My mother told me that my grandfather, who, who died there, who I never met, of course, uh, he loved to collect guns, which was illegal in Poland in the 1930s. And he got into trouble. And at the beginning of the war, a Polish army unit stopped at his barn and asked to spend the night there right after the invasion. The next day, they were gone. They left behind all their guns. And so him and another neighbor went in the barn, dug a big hole, and wrapped the guns up real good and buried them. So when this goes out on YouTube, if there's somebody living in what is now the Ukraine, uh, in a place that used to be called Podhaitche, I know its name's been changed in the Ukraine, but it was put, put high check. If you can find where the Zahovich farm was and where the barn might have been, this meager collection can, can easily be surpassed if you know where to dig, okay? So I, again, I grew up with the stories and I wanted to collect Polish guns and there just wasn't any information. I mean, there was a little section in Small Arms of the World and the Guns of the World by W.H.B. Smith. But, and then to this very day, if there's still a problem, if you're a Polish collector, you have to look all over and find pieces here and there and there, particularly if you want it in the English language. And unfortunately for me, it's been 54 years since I took Polish lessons in St. Adalbert's. Uh, 64 years since I took Polish lessons at St. Adalbert's. And... Um, I can make out a few words here and there. So what happened in Poland, okay? The country was created as part of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, that there would be a Poland for people who spoke Polish, okay? They, 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 they would have their own country again. And in October of 1918, they had created on French soil a Polish army. It was called the Haller Army after General Haller, or the Blue Army fully equipped with French weapons. And they were going to be part of the big Allied offensive in the spring of 1919 that was going to bring the war to a close, invade Germany, and end the Great War. Well, therefore, Poland was considered an Allied nation, even though it didn't exist, because it was contributing a military force that would be used in the Great Offensive. But of course, in November, Austria dropped out of the war, and then, of course, Germany signed the armistice. Okay, now the armistice is not a surrender, even though that's how people treat it. It was an agreement to stop the fighting and just negotiate. At the time of the armistice, Germany was not occupied. They were occupying French and Belgian soil. 
They were not sent to POW camps. They marched home carrying their weapons, figuring, okay, this is over. The Kaiser fucked us. You know, we're gonna we're gonna work things out. Not knowing that, of course, the a lot of the Allies wanted revenge for what had happened, and we're gonna blame the German people, not the Kaiser. Now, what are you gonna do with the Haller army? Well, now you're creating a new nation called Poland on the other side of Germany. And this nation, of course, is gonna have neighbors that are gonna want the same soil. Lithuanians, Ukrainians, Germans, Russians. Uh, big mistake at the end of World War I, they redrew the boundary lines, they didn't move the people. And that created, well, that creates World War II. So what are you gonna do with the Haller army? They make a deal with the Germans, because every month the armistice had to be renewed. The war is not over. And the Germans aren't really glad to see a Polish army go marching through Germany to get to Poland. So they make a deal. The army is loaded on a sealed train, sent to Poland. Its weapons are put on other sealed trains, sent to Poland, roll through Germany. They're never unloaded. They don't stop for food or anything else. They're sealed trains. They go right through, and they end up in what's going to be the Second Republic. Well, one of the problems that the Second Republic is going to have is you've got to create a nation, you've got to create an army. Poland had been divided between Russia, Austria, and Germany. Some of its soldiers were in the Austrian army, German army, Russian army. And some of its officers have been trained in different armies. They had different equipment. So they now have a problem of how are you going to, how are you going to arm, train, and equip this army. And if you go through the books, they'll tell you things like, well, they had 35 different weapons firing 25 different calibers, including guns from the Republic of Mexico. All right? So I started doing my research, and a lot of fun here. Okay? All right, these are the guns they had from Germany. Commission rifles, 8805s, Gewehr 98s, 98AZs. And they gave it their own name. From France, Gross 1874s, Lavelles, Model 92 carbines, Bertier 0715s, Bertier 16, Bertier carbines, Romania, Manlickers, all right, and they gave them their own designation. That's bad enough. Okay. Austria Hungary, Wendell single shot repeaters, Wendell carbines. 8890 Manlickers, 1890 Carbines, 95 Manlickers, 95 Carbines. Russian, Mosin began 1891, Moshe began Dragoons, Winchester 95, Berdan uh, Mark II. Belgian, Mauser, Britain, P14 Enfields. All right? Oh, we have more fun. All right? Turkey, Italy, Japan including the famous Type 38 Mexican contract rifle, okay, in 7 millimeter. all right? So now you've got this massive accumulation. Everyone's got a different caliber, different parts, require different training, and, you know, what are you going to do? Well, France comes along and says, don't worry, don't worry. We will supply you with all the French guns you could possibly want, okay? Labelles and Bertiers and show shows and everything else. And sort of the, the Polish general staff is going, these guns are crap. <laughs> okay? Uh, we want something better. And what they decide what they really want is Mausers. 98 Mausers. That's what they're looking at. Okay? All right, let me see where I got that thing there. 98 Mausers is going to be their, their goal. All right. Oh, let's see what I got here. Okay. So, where are they going to get 98 Mausers? Um, they're not the only country that's got this problem. All right. You've got the new country of Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia. All right. You got a whole bunch of countries that are trying to organize an army, all right? I call it the post-World War I weapon swap, all right? Poland wanted Mausers, Latvia wanted P-14s, Finland wanted Mosins, Estonia wanted P-14s, 
Yugoslavia wanted man liquors. Okay? So what did they do? They traded. They simply traded. Finland would give you any Mauser 98 you wanted, you give them a Moisen. Okay? Austria, Hungary, uh, no, sorry, Yugoslavia, they were at first wanting, they were first big onto man liquor. Later on, they're going to switch to Mausers, but okay. And they start swapping back and forth. The next step was well, what about making them? As part of the Treaty of Versailles, the German imperial government had to give up all of its arsenals. Spandau, Erfurt, Danzig, you know some other ones? Can you think of them? Okay. DWM. What? DWM. DWM. No, here's the thing. Mauser and Simpson Sewell were considered private companies. And they said, no, we just we just want the German government not to have any more weapons factories. They're going to have to be dismantled or converted to peaceful use. Okay? Now, in the city of Danzig, which was the free city of Danzig, which was not supposed to be part of Germany, there was a massive imperial arsenal making Gewehr 98 and the AZ model, the Car 98. And Poland goes to them and says, can you make rifles for us? And they're like, yeah. And the disarmament commission goes, no, 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 no. If you've got a factory making guns and you're going to make them for Poland, you can also make them for Germany. You can't make guns. That's a no-no. So what they do is they award all the machinery at Danzig to the new Republic of Poland. They go, take all the machines that make guns, take them wherever you want. They can't stay in Danzig. That, that's it. They can make bicycles in Danzig. They can't make rifles anymore. All right? And a lot of books will go, well, Poland got this machinery as reparations for the war. Poland did not receive reparations. To get reparations, you had to be a nation that was in existence in 1914 when the war started, or the U.S. And still in the war at the end of the war. So Russia, fuck you. Okay? No reparations for them. They had dropped out of the war. They can't get any reparations. Belgium's going to get reparations, Italy's going to get reparations, England, France, all right, and the United States. So Poland gets the machinery, and they decide they will standardize on the Mauser 98. That is going to be the weapon of the Polish Second Republic, all right? But they first acquire all the Mausers they can find. Now, how do you get Polish provenance on these Mausers? They're, remember, they're just regular German already made Mausers. All right. As an example, this is a Spandau 1916 Gewehr. All right. It's got the lang sight, the long barrel, everything else. The only way I got Polish provenance on it is on above the pole, above the Spandau Imperial Crown, the Kaiser's Crown, is an FB Verratum. So the gun got sent to Rand for some kind of repair or work or whatever, and I've seen a few of these now where you see the FB stamped into the receiver. That gives it Polish provenance. Without that, it's just it's a Gewehr, Gewehr 98. I'm, I'm sure a lot of them were used just the way they were. I have seen pictures of where they X'd out all the German markings and just have the FB, but most of the ones that I've seen, you have the original German markings, FB is added, and a lot of times they'll add a K to the serial number for Karabina. Karabina, where's my Polish speakers? I'll be messing it up. All right. Now, the Danzig factory is going to be moved to Warsaw. Now, this is a car 98. Okay? This one here is Erfurt, 1918. Now, in 1918, the Germans had decided that this would really be their battle rifle. And for every Gewehr, they made three of these. Okay? The factory at Danzig was also making these. For whatever reason, and God knows why, Poland decided to only make Gewehrs at Warsaw. And they are the holy grail for Polish collectors. Can't find them. Okay? 
They are rare. You know, I have contacts in Poland, same thing. They have a lot of trouble finding a Warsaw Gewehr. 22,000 were made. They're described in all the books as a rough version of the German Gewehr. Now, they also wanted to use the AZ model. This one here is an AZ, and the way you spot a Polish modification, is no FB on it, is they will often have a trigger guard from a Gewehr, where it's got the little hole here for the sling, and they usually change the sling swivels. They usually mounted one on the bottom, usually one below here. This one here must be an early conversion. It doesn't have, it has an original Car 98 band here. I'll show you the other ones. And it still has the original stacking hook. All right, the original stacking hook that was on the German Car 98. And this still is marked Car 98. And it's got imperial marks on it. And it's just the early version of what Poland was doing. Like I said, they, for whatever reason, they wanted to put 98 uh, trigger guards and change the sling swivels. But basically, it's the same gun. All right? Now, they also had a lot of Moisen rifles that they wanted to modify. They didn't want any, for whatever reason, they were avoiding the 762 Russian cartridge. Again, most of the guns were going to Finland, going to Finland. But they decided that they could modify the Moisen into an 8mm carbine. So when you run into these things, it's not some frankincense, uh, you know, collector went nuts. They modified these guns to take 8mm Mauser ammunition. And this one here, which I'll show you the markings, was made in Warsaw in 1925. The very early, early models, which is another one of those holy grail of Polish collectors, it's going to have the hook from a Car 98, and it takes a Moisen bayonet, which you know is, sticks out to here. They made that the model, uh, 1923 model. After a while, they decided no, they're going to make it so it takes a Mauser bayonet, and it's not going to have a stacking hook at all. Now, Bob McKinnon, who was president of this club many years ago, and a gunsmith, he found a real low number, 91, 98, 25, and he, before he died, he was working on building a, a 1923 model, which would take the hook and take a Moisen bayonet. Unfortunately, I don't know whether he ever completed that project or not. But all you see, in, uh, in, even in Poland, are pictures of the 1923 model. <coughs> the 1925 model, which is this, and then there's a 1926 model, minor change in internal part, irrelevant, okay? This one is called a 91-98-25. Moisen Gant 91, 98 in 8 millimeter Mauser, 25 the year it was adopted. Two manufacturers, Warsaw and Arma Lvov. And the two differ in how the sling swivels are put on. This is an Arma Lvov, L-W-O-W. Um, it's an 8 millimeter, takes the, Russian, uh, takes the German bayonet, and the sling swivels on this one are only on the bottom. The other one, you could wear, you could have them on the side if you were cavalry or something, or you had to put it across your back. The Arma Lvov are like this. I've done a lot of research. I've got pictures there. They seem to be the difference between the two guns. All right. Um, the Fort Lee, sorry, General Lee of the Airborne, not Robert E. His museum in Dunn, North Carolina, it's called the Airborne Museum. He's called the Father of the Airborne. But he was too old and had a heart problem, so that's why he didn't jump into Normandy or anything else. He gave it. To, he turned it over to young guys. Your airborne generals were all young guys. It was a young man's game. Anyway, one of these is in their museum, and it's listed as captured by airborne troops from an Ost battalion, OST, Eastern unit. The Germans are going to use this for fortress troops because it takes eight, it takes eight millimeter Mauser in a stripper clip, takes a German bayonet, your ammo pouches, everything else are fine. And if you're sitting in a bunker looking out toward the English Channel, 
All right. They can save the 98K for the Eastern Front. All right. Now, after making the Gewehr VZ WZ 98, of which I have a reprint of a Polish manual here, in Strata Obroni Piechoty, my Polish, it's Weapons of the Infantry. That's another thing that surprised the Army. I had to take a test in Polish, and they kept using military terms, and I had no problem with that. And they were looking at me, and they're going, Where'd you learn that stuff? You know, you're, most guys that speak Polish know, you know, which way to the drugstore, the train on time, and the movies. And here's me going, you know, Bagnetti means bayonet, Piechoty means infantry, Panzeri or tanks. Too many war stories, I'm going to go out. Alright, so Poland started making its own KBK rifle, and this one here is from Warsaw, 1926, and this is the unique feature you got to look for. Whenever you see this, only Poland made this kind of a stacking hook. This is the one you'll spot, and you'll see the sling swivels, they're on the bottom and on the side. Alright. Um, Finding slings for these rifles has always been a pain. Some people want, like, you know, 75 hours, original Polish slings, things like that. I took a chance. I saw a picture of some Polish slings, and I said, wait a minute. They got a lot of guns from France. I wonder if French slings fit. They fit beautifully. So I just put French slings on them, ones made for LaBelle's and Berthier's and things like that. And uh, they fit. They're the right size. But you'll see, again, the stacking hook, and this is... BFK Warszawa, 1926. A lot of these guns got sent to Spain, which I want to get into. And when I first went looking for Polish rifles, I went to Sarko one time, and they told me, yeah, we got a whole bunch of Polish rifles in the back. We'll bring you the best one. And the best one looked like it had been dragged through the Vistula or something. I mean, it was just rusty, crappy. And they were breaking them apart for the parts because they had gotten them from Spain. And these guns were just, you know, no collector, you know, it was, just, it was just garbage. So it took me a long time to get my hands on a real Varsava. Now, the next gun is the same thing, only made at Radom, PWB Radom, 1927. And one of the things you start spotting with Polish rifles, you'll see a little black dot here and here and here. They reinforced their wood, their Polish beach, with hardwood dowels. And you can spot them because they're a darker wood. I don't know whether they're some kind of a walnut or what. But that's one of the things you look for for Polish rifles is the little black dot which indicates a wooden dowel that's used for reinforcing the handguard so it doesn't break. And the back of the stock here uh, behind the uh, magazine box, the ammunition, you know. That's the reinforcement. And again, the unique Polish uh, stacking hook. Those are the things you look for. All right. Now, let's see if we'll, let me put the other chart there. All right. Uh, I gotta reach over. Okay. Polish marks. Okay. Things you look for. PFK Warszawa. Beautiful. It's nice and easy. The Warsaw Arsenal. WRN number one and Armour Levuk are only found on the converted Moisens. The early Radom rifles have PWB Radom, which I think means the National Rifle Factory, and then FB Radom, which is Weapons Factory, Radom. On the side of the receiver, they'll be marked either WZ-98, K-98, K-29, WZ-29, WZ-98A, or just 98A. FB, Fabrica Broni, Radom. The Z, confuses a lot of people because it's very similar to the Czechoslovakian mark. And people go, I think it's a Czechoslovakian rifle. And ZBR sometimes in the stock and it's on some bayonets. And the ZBR means an armory or a repair facility. So you might run into to them. Alright? We're going to get into designations later. Bayonets. They started making their own bayonets. Okay? The first one they made was called the WZ-22. It's a very thin blade. They tend to break. I don't have one. <laughs> uh, they then went to this model, WZ-24. It's a copy of the German, but it's got a heftier, when you feel it, you can tell there's a lot more metal in it. And the bright blade, bright metal, and they're marked WZ-24. 
24, okay? This particular one, which was not mine, uh, comes with an Africa core or desert German frog and scabbard. The Germans are going to take all the Polish bayonets they can find and just put them into their supply system. If you find a Polish bayonet, it usually has WP on it, Wojska Polska, which means Polish Army. Uh, they didn't take off the markings, they just issued them out to the Germans. If it needed repair, they blew it. They would blew it, but if it's still bright, it was, you know, as issued. Alright? Two Banger manufacturers. One is Radom, FB Radom. The other is Perkun. And Perkun is in Warsaw. And again, good, solid bayonet. It fits all the rifles. Alright? Good, solid bayonet. Later on, they're going to add a ring onto it when they come to the next rifle, which I'll get to the WZ-29, which was supposed to be the Polish standard rifle for the war. Uh, bright blade, bright metal, usually not marked with a, with a designation. And they were made by Radom, and you come up here later, they were also made by Perkun, the Perkun company, okay? Uh, when the Germans took these, if, they, if it had to be redone, they would grind off the ring. They didn't feel the need for a ring. They would grind off the ring, blue the blade, sometimes change the grips. Alright? So, other countries like Czechoslovakia and stuff are going to smaller Mausers, shorter Mausers, a lighter weight, and the Poles decided to do the same thing, and they developed the Model 29. This was going to be the standard rifle of the Polish army for a while. This is the one they wanted. Now, all of them are made with a cutout for the bolt handle. The bolt handles you'll see are checkered underneath. That's a copy from the AZ, uh, car 98 AZ. But they made them with straight bolts for dismounted and curved bolts theoretically were for mounted troops. That's the story that's always printed well, one's for the cavalry, one's for the infantry. Well, there's not more than cavalry and infantry in any military unit. There's supply troops, engineers, signal, artillery, you know. But all the books go, infantry got straight bolts, cavalry got bent bolts. Uh, this was going to be their premier rifle. Uh, the early ones were marked K-29 for Karabinek, and then later on they're going to mark them WZ-29. There is no V in the Polish language. Yeah, I told you, I'll we'll get to that. But anyway, it's a good Mauser. And Poland then ran into an issue of money. 1930s, a depression. Um, they needed money. And along with Belgium and Czechoslovakia, they become exporters of Mausers. Now, Poland offered you the best price, but you had to pick it up at Danzig, at the Baltic. So your shipping costs had to be factored in. Czechoslovakia, you know, you had to get it out of landlocked Czechoslovakia. And of course, Belgium had Antwerp. But they were the three main exporters of Mausers. And you're going to say, well, they're a poor country. They sat down and figured it out. For every two Polish Mausers they sold, they made enough to build three for, their, for themselves. So they started getting into the weapons business. They would sell two, make three for their own forces. And they would sell to, you know, almost anybody. And we're going to get into arms exporting in Poland. All right, 1929, they sent 3,000 to Hejaz, now called Saudi Arabia, and Afghanistan got 100. Then in 1930, they sold 10,000 to the Hejaz and 4,200 to China. 1931, 8,000 to China. 1936, they sent 1,600 to Palestine. Now, I had a life book on Saudi Arabia. There's one scene, all these guys on camels with Polish rifles. The KBK is waving them. I'm like, what the hell? How did they get there? Finally found the answer, okay? They were buying them. Then came the Spanish Civil War. And the Spanish Civil War, the countries theoretically all agreed that they would not sell weapons to either side in the Spanish Civil War. Well, 
Germany and Italy didn't really sell. They gave Franco all the weapons he wanted. The Soviet Union was willing to sell weapons to the Republic in return for Spanish gold. They cleaned out the Spanish gold reserves. Whether it was Aztec gold or gold doubloons, they took it all. They told the Spanish Republic, we'll safeguard it for you. Okay? And then when the Spanish Republic lost, and Franco's government goes, can we have the Spanish gold reserves back? Stalin's answer was, that was used to pay for all the weapons we sent you. Oh, your, your, your opponent, we sent to your opponent. So Spain was totally out of gold by 1939. But the Soviets did some wheeling and dealing where they secretly bought Polish weapons to be sent to Spain indirectly. So Poland was getting Spanish gold too. All right? And here's what started to happen, okay? Uh, 1936, 9,300 guns to uh, China. Mm -mm. To Mexico. Mm -mm. Greece. No, nope. China. No, nope. Greece, Peru. No, 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 no. All of them ended up in Spain. And what Poland did was the same thing the Russians did. They cleaned out their arsenals. They took all the old Winchester 95s, 7 millimeter Arasakas, Carcanos, every junk gun they had, and they packed it up, and they sent them out to Spain. The Spanish Republic was willing to buy any gun as long as it came with a couple of boxes of ammunition. All right? Now, in addition, Poland had created what is called the export model. And as you can see, it's the same gun. The only difference, nothing at all on the receiver, just a serial number. And these have flooded into the United States. I guess Spain ended up with a lot of these. There's one exception. Spain took a lot of these, and the belief is they stamped their Air Force crest right there, because their, their Air Force Model 43 rifle is an exact copy of this. But you will find a lot of what are called scrubbed Polish Mausers. They include the KBK model. You'll find some of them with this hook. Nothing on the receiver. And they'll tell you, oh, it's, a, it's made in Radom. It's a Radom rifle. Yes, it is. But there's no markings on it. And it's not because they're trying to hide the fact it was not for the Polish, it was not for the Polish Army. It was for sale. And if you go to gun shops, gun shows and stuff, you, you will run into a lot of scrubbed uh, Polish Mausers. Again, if you're a Polish collector, eh, you know, I got one as a representative piece. I had another one. Newt has it now. <laughs> I care. Yeah. Better but, than that. Yeah. But it's, if you see something like this with no markings at all, but it's got the front sight like this, or it's got this stacking hook, it's Polish. All right? 1936 or so, the Polish government decided we need long rifles. Everybody else in the world is moving away from long rifles. But for whatever reason, they decided they needed long rifles. So they first started rebuilding some of the Gewehrs they had. All right? This is a rebuilt Gewehr. The stock is Polish beech with the reinforcing wood dowels. All the German markings were ground off, and they put a little Z in the triangle, and they marked it on the side, 98A. And they got rid of the line sight and put a regular tangent sight on it. This gun is interesting. It has no import marks on it, as I'm going to get into, because for years nobody knew what these guns were. Wait, now what's that mark? Czechoslovakian? I don't know. Nothing else on it. It, that was the problem. There was so little knowledge on Polish rifles that, you know, it was constantly, you know, what is it? And I was surprised when I found this rifle because it got no import marks on it. It's got a Polish stock, re you know, everything else. It's a 98 Gewehr made into, it's just basically changed the tangent sight because they were going to make their own rifle. 
WZ-98. Now, if you're a hunter or a fisherman, there's always a story of the deer that got away, the fish that got away. When I was in college, Polish Mausers, the books would say, Gewehr 98, $40. Polish model, 10% less. One of my fraternity brothers ended up with a Radom rifle, 1930s, WZ-98, bolt was 10 digits off, nice Polish eagle on it, beautiful rifle. And he bought it for $35 because 10% off if it's a Polish Gewehr. Beautiful gun, loved it. I go into the Army, I come back, I run into him, he already traded it, sold it off, whatever. 25 years later, I run into a Polish rifle, mint condition, all matching everything else, at the Fort Lee Gun Club. And the guy had just bought it at auction for some ungodly price, and he was there to show it off. Oh well, 10 years go by, Heritage had a Polish rifle like this, but it had a German 98K bolt and some German parts on it, and it was, I think, 1700 uh, Not ready for that one. Five years go by, I run into a Polish collector, he goes, I got two of them. Uh, they got some cracks in the stock, uh, the mismatch, you can have them for 1200 They estimate about 50,000 of these were made. Uh, again, if you're a Polish collector, this is the one you want. Uh, I've got six radios, but this is the only Polish one. All right? Nice gun, single stack, nine millimeter. The Germans liked it a lot, which I'm gonna get into. Uh, it's a good pistol, used around the world. The 82nd Division Museum at Fort Bragg, they have one on display that the Israelis took off an Egyptian officer. So God knows how these things, where they end up. But if you can find one with the Polish Eagle, and I know this one's a member of the club who's not here, he claims he has one too. Uh, again, it's one of the things, you know, if you're a Polish collector, you're, you're trying to find this. Uh, I'm in contact with a Polish collector in, in Poland, and he just got one that's got rust on it, everything else, and he's sending it out to a gunsmith who's going to fix it up. But he found a Polish Eagle Radom in France and had it shipped to Poland. Uh, the collectors there now can collect. Before then, you got into trouble. And they said once they made it legal to collect, it was amazing how many guns were found in attics, <laughs> garages, <laughs> basements. Okay? Buried. Yeah, buried, you know. But Haitia, if you find out where the village is, and you got a metal detector, and find a Zahovich farm, uh, you can probably put my collection to shame. And one of my buddies that, I call him my buddy, Bolas, yeah, uh, he showed me pictures of one guy with the Polish BAR, so God knows what the, what are, what are the goodies there are, are out there. Um, yeah, they already, you know, wouldn't it be interesting, I remember the amnesty in 1968, which came and went like in 30 days. Uh, if they ever declare another amnesty where you can pull out your machine gun and just tell them you got it and they tell you to take it home with you, God knows how much stuff is floating around this country. But uh, they only did it for 30 days. And where's John Jack? Still here? John? Oh, he had a friend of his who called up and was, wasn't sure he was going to do it, so he changed his mind. He didn't register his three jet machine guns. And all you had to do was, okay, fill out some papers. Okay, you're not going to be arrested for it. Uh, yeah, sorry! Stan, but if you do that, don't, you have no right to transfer it to your family. No, if, if, it's, not, if it's not registered. The thing is, when they had the amnesty in 68, it was for 30 days, you, you, you legally papered it. But your family couldn't. Yeah, it was legally papered. Uh, whether it was a DWAT or live, both DWATs had to be registered too. Because before then, DWATs were no concern, no concern. And then, of course, they found out people were rewatting, or whatever term you want to use, and, and, and you know, making them, making them sing again, you know. I remember when I first started collecting, I knew a few people who went to that stuff, and their expression for a rewat was, it's been raped. <laughs> but you can still fuck it. <laughs> and then they would say things like, never been kissed, never been kissed. Alright, now what happened at the 
Polish-German invasion there. Well, needless to say, Poland was in trouble. The Nazis grabbed all these guns and said, great guns, we're going to use them. And what they did is they just renumbered them. They renumbered them and put them in their supply system. They had no trouble. There were, there were 98 Mausers and stuff like that. A lot of them ended up at first in North Africa because some of the units were equipped with Polish weapons. And when Polish Americans were in North Africa and they captured some of these guns, they sent them back to the United States so now you know, collectors got to see what Polish rifles looked like. The other big source, that was, right after, that was during World War II. After World War II, Spain unloaded a lot of Polish rifles because they needed money. They needed hard currency. And a lot of them came into the country, and I was told that my VZ-29 up there uh, probably came out of Spain, because the guy that bought it said he bought it in the 1950s. And he said Spain would take some of them and recondition them, re-blue them, redo the stocks, do a nice job, and send them to the United States for hard currency. So that was another source. Well, then came along, okay, the 68 Gun Control Act said no more imports, so where are you going to get Polish weapons, okay? Uh, some are coming in through Canada, particularly the Scruff Mausers. A lot of them somehow went to Canada and then were infiltrated. Build the wall in the south, don't build the wall in the north, okay? And they came into the United States through Ohio and places like that. And again, if you were a collector, the Scruff Mauser was better than nothing, but you really wanted ones that had Warsaw, uh, Radom, you know, rather than the Scruff Mauser. All right, so as the guns come in, then there was nothing, there, was, there weren't any. Then in the 1990s, when the you know, Iron Curtain fell, Romania and Albania opened up their warehouses to American gun dealers. Now, Glenn DeRuiter was a good friend of mine from my college days and eventually ended up being assistant manager at Sarko, got sent by Charlie Steen to Albania. And he had to go into these caves where there were boxes and boxes of Lugers, P-38s, Mauser rifles all over the place. And the guys are climbing up there and they're pulling them out and they're showing them. Look at this. He said he saw a plastic stock, 98K, beware variations, everything else. He says, my God, it was a collector heaven. And they were just in these caves where they weren't always uh, humidity controlled, but they were just boxes and boxes of German military. And well, so what happened after World well, after the Germans invaded? Well, again, I pointed out they just took these guns and added them to their supply system and uh, gave them new numbers, new designations, and, and used them. Now, when they went to the Albanian Romanian warehouses, they started to find guns that nobody had solved the mystery of the 98As. And you get some very interesting variations, okay? This is my favorite, only this gun could talk. All right? This started life as an Imperial German 98 Mauser. Along the way, it ended up in the, in the Bavarian Freikorps. That's the EWB, which was larger. The official German army was supposed to be limited to 100,000 members. I think the Bavarian Freikorps had 900,000. Okay, so the Allies went nuts. Okay, you're, you're you know, what you, you, know, you, you know, we know what you're doing. You're creating another German army. So this gun ended up with the Fry Corps, but they stamped everything EWB. You'll find Lugers with EWB. You'll find broom handled Mausers. You'll find a good number of Mauser rifles with EWB burnt into the wood. That was their indicator. Okay, the gun somehow ended up in Poland. It's got the Z. Okay, so it ended up being a Polish rifle. Got captured by the Germans because they put a sight hood on their rifles. They modified the front sight, and there were German parts in this gun, followers, other parts. Captured by the Russians, given to the Romanians, who also used German guns for a long time, but they were an ally. Century Arms import mark here in the 1990s. Got sent to Century Arms, St. Albans. Sarko bought 24 of them. Got sent to Sarko. Glenn DeRuiter gives me a call. I got some Polish rifles for you. I'll pick the two best ones and put them in my office. Unfortunately, a week later he died. He had the accident. 
So I show up at Sarco and I go, by any chance, yeah, they're in the office. They pulled out two of these 98As. Uh, they're not the best of shape, but it's an interesting history, like I said, from Imperial to a Fry Corps to the Polish to the German to the Russians to the Romanians and then to the United States. The other gun that you're going to run into, the one that had me messed up for years, is a 2940. All right? I think I was 16 years old. I walked into a gun shop in Linden called Jack Gordon Incorporated. I bought a lot of stuff from him. All right. And in the rack, he had this rifle, and I'm looking at it. It's got a Polish Eagle, which guys like me know what they look like. It's found on uh, bread. It's found on flags. It's found on symbols everywhere. Still, people call it the chicken. Okay. It's a Polish Eagle, and it has FB Radom 1938. And I'm going, oh my God, I found a Polish Army rifle. Wait till I tell Uncle Adam, you know? So I tell Uncle Adam, and this is before his firearms IDs and, and you know, all that stuff. You know, he could have walked in, given the guy the money, and gone home with it. And I'm hoping he's going to do it, let me play with it, right? So I tell the guy, wow, how much you want for the Polish rifle? He goes, it's not Polish. See that 660? That's Austria. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm 14 years old, 16 years old. I'm smarter than this guy. I know a Polish eagle when I see a Polish eagle, right? So I get my uncle and my aunt to come to the store, and I'm hoping he's going to buy this thing. You know, it's like $30 or something. And he looks at it. No, nah, that's not the rifle I carry. No. Nah. But while we're here, he buys me a holster for a 45 automatic. Okay, yeah. make me happy. A couple of years later, I run into a rifle, this rifle, belongs to a fraternity brother of mine. It's nice to have fraternity brothers who are Jewish and love Nazi shit. It's just amazing, though. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and his attitude was, they tried to kill my people. Now they're all gone, and their shit is just decorations in my house. All right, so he had this rifle. And we're looking at it, it's got swastika and eagles on it, it's got WZ-29 with the WZ marked off in a slash 40. But I'm looking at it, FB Radom, FB Radom, it's Polish, it's Polish. So he wanted a more authentic German rifle, 98K, so he sells me this. And for years, this is my Polish rifle, right? All right, here's the story. <laughs> When the Germans took over the Radom factory, they found boxes and boxes of W20 VZ29 receivers. And they sent over the weapons experts from the Steyr plant. And the Steyr people looked over the factory and they took all that German machinery that used to be in Danzig and then shipped it to Austria. They took all the finished receivers. They took all the unfinished receivers and they started making a 98K, but they don't call it a 98K. They mark off the WZ-29 and slash 40 in 1940. Why? Because a lot of these guns are going to be marked either Air Force or Navy. Because the Wehrmacht had made a deal with Hitler. They were the prime arms-bearing members of the new German state. Therefore, they had priority for all 98 Ks. This is not a 98 K. This is a 2940. Paperwork. It's like a Pinto and a Bobcat, for those of you who remember those two cars. Okay? This is a 98 K, but they call it a 2940 so they can sell it to the Air Force and the Navy for more than what the Army would pay for a 98K. All right, the 660 is Steyr. When they run out of Polish receivers, they still got finished receivers, so they just keep making them and calling them 2940s, and then somebody found out what they were doing and they had to stop. But that's what this gun is. My first Polish rifle, the Germans considered an Austrian rifle. And if I'm going to say that's a Polish rifle made from German parts, then i got to say this is a German rifle, I mean, a, a Polish rifle made from German parts, this is a German rifle made from Polish parts. But if you run into these, they want some outrageous prices for them now. Brand, 2940. So if you run into them, something to think about. All right? Whoops. Make sure I covered everything with you guys.
Polish designations, okay, Polish marks, all right, exports, oh, okay, 1938, and this was the inventory of the Polish army, okay, so you can see they had a lot of these WZ-29s, 98 long rifles, I got the manual here for it, it's the Gewehr 98, the 98As, they still had a lot of leftover French guns. Now, my father told me that in his village, they were locked up at the police station. And like once a month, you had to go down to the police station, they would hand you a French rifle, and you had to do drill with it. And every now and then, if you were lucky, they gave you three rounds to fire. And my sister, my, my, my Aunt Jenny tells me the story, how she was filming one day, and she thought she saw a skeleton. She saw fingers coming out of the ground. She panicked and ran away. So, of course, her brothers, my uncles and my father, woo, they go out and they find a stripper clip of five rounds of ammunition, okay, sticking out of the ground. What caliber was it? All they knew is they could probably jam it into their French rifle. <laughs> so they jammed it into the French rifle, tied it to a tree, put a string around the trigger, and they got it to go off. All right, so that was one of those stories I got from uh, my family. The gun worked, and they still had four rounds left, you know, whatever caliber they were. All right, uh, 1938, they still had some man lickers. Uh, 1939, they were still selling guns to Spain, and I saw the shipping thing. Uh, Poland was getting rid of all its Austrian guns. Uh, machine guns and rifles, so probably by the time the war started there weren't any manlickers left in Poland. Uh, they were all being shipped to Spain and uh, they had the old ammunition. Uh, if you guys get manlickers, you know you've got uh, Spitzer point. What do they mark on the receiver? They, they've been converted to take a Spitzer point. S. S, right, there's an S on it. Mm -hmm. All the ones we get now are converted, but before then they took a round nose, uh, yeah. yeah, a round nose. Long jump bullet. And uh, the Poles only had the old stuff. Uh, Polish rifles, we don't think any of them were end converted. They were all the original LaBelle 8mm uh, caliber. So where did they all end up? I said, probably Spain. And uh, Moisins, they sold uh, like 50,000 of them to Yugoslavia right before the war. But they still had them for their border patrol, uh, forestry service, and some others. So they do pop up. Um, so that gives you the history development of Polish rifles, what to look for if you want to be a collector. If you find a long Warsaw rifle, please let me know. That's the only thing left on my Polish bucket list. Okay? <laughs> After searching for a Radom rifle for 52 years, finally had one. And uh, now the only major rifle I need is the... the uh, Warsaw. Now, there are other Polish rifles out there that I, I don't have. Uh, there are 22 trainers. Uh, Bobby Kennan had one of these. It's a KBK made into a single shot 22. And there is one that's a, it looks like it's supposed to be a 29, but the mechanism is entirely different. If you buy a Polish training rifle, it looks like a Moisin. That's the mechanism. Uh, but they, they made a full size rifle. It was also the Polish anti tank rifle, the Uruguay, they call it. 8 millimeter. Eight millimeter. How are you going to stop a tank with an 8 millimeter? Yeah, it's 8 millimeter. But it's got a big ass price behind it. And it was very high velocity. I think it's the WZ 35. Now, uh, at the Polish uh, Cultural Center last year, there was a display, and one guy brought in the ammunition. I'll, I don't know. Andrew, do you know if he's got the rifle? Yes, I've got some of it, but I don't know the ammunition. You got the ammunition. Does anybody around here have the rifle? They're legal. Yeah, I know. Legal, but nobody is going to sell. Yeah. Uh, Poland had this rifle that was their secret weapon. It was a big ass Mauser that followed a think of a 50 caliber machine gun round neck to 8 millimeter. Okay? <laughs> and what it would do is if it hit a tank, it would cause spalling. That means it would cause the inside of the tank to shred and the armor would fly around inside like a giant shotgun. All right? It stopped Panzer IIs. It, it worked. 
And when the Germans captured it, they incorporated it into their weapon system, and they used it at first on the Eastern Front on some Russian stuff. Then, of course, the Russians upgraded, and it wasn't any good, so they sold it to the Italians. I'm serious. They ended up in Italy, and that's where they seem to have disappeared. But it's a big, long, uh, bolt-action rifle, 8-millimeter anti-tank rifle. And they were, like, kept secret, and they were marked in boxes for Uruguay, for some reason. Like, they're going to be exported. And only a few soldiers were secretly trained, you know, this is how this thing is used, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, they had it. Although my uncle told me, again, this is a war story from my uncle. He said for a while there, he said they were training dogs to run with explosives, to run under a tank, and they had like a tilt bar. And when the dog ran under the tank, the tilt bar would set off the explosive and you could blow a tank up from underneath. I found out later whether he had picked up that story because the Russians, yeah, the, Russian, the, Russians did that. the Russians did that. And they trained their dogs well. The only problem was the dogs were trained to run for the smell of gasoline in the Russian tanks, not the diesel of the German tanks. You got that the other way. The other way around? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Whatever it is, too many friendly fire incidents with their dogs jumping under the wrong tank. So, you know, whatever it was. All right? Do I have any questions on anything here? I'll try to answer them. Yeah? How long did the Polish army exist in? Well, once the fighting started, and basically the war was basically in three cases. <clears throat> the, 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 the strategy was they were to fall back to the Vistula River, and in the meantime, France would attack across the Maginot Line and put pressure on the Germans, and the British would start strategic bombing. The reality was, as they pulled back, they were outnumbered to start with, then the Russians invited themselves in from the other side. The French never left France, and the British were still arguing over whether they should bomb civilian or private industry <coughs> in Germany under Chamberlain. So basically, the, the, the doctrine or the plan for defending Poland fell apart right away. And when the Russians came, it was all over. So in about three or four weeks, you know, that was it. My landlord was a in the Polish army, and he said that he was in the army for three days. <laughs> three days, yeah. Yeah, my uncle, who got, again, the one with the, the Steyer pistol, he got wounded. And this is interesting. He got wounded in the wrist. The medic took the cleaning rod out of the rifle, put a patch on it, sprayed it, with, dipped it in an iodine bottle, ran it through his wrist, ran it out again, and put bandages on it. That's it. And he had the scar for the rest of his life. He said, yeah. Yeah, tough love. So now you know another use for your cleaning rods. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, and consider becoming a Patreon member for the ASP. Please check out the ASP Patreon page.